Just like that, I'm back in here again. <laughs> Just like that. Be at home yesterday, a little cross-eyed. Definitely fell into a deep coma last night. Holy shit. Woke up at 4 o'clock on time to go fishing, but I wasn't going fishing this morning. Fishing, fishing, fishing. A uh, quick note on that, I got a good friend of mine whose boat is at the same dock. Probably the best fisherman I've ever met in my life. And um, he's the guy who's got the boat in Cabo. We do the tuna in Marlin down. He does the tuna in Marlin down there. And he also has a tuna boat here to do tuna charters off of Vancouver Island from our dock. As well as the same usual salmon halibut. And I think he's got days open from August 22nd on for the last week of salmon halibut. And then after that, he transitions to tuna. If you want in on some of that action, get a hold of me. Email Sarah, I think, at bucket how to You can get a hold of those days to come fishing. Highly, highly recommended. Now, mine's going blank. Probably had a whole bunch of shit to drop here, but... Adventure dogs out there with a bone, <laughs> as usual. Oh my god, I got a lot of emails. Let's just get right into it. And hear the voice of the people, alright? The voice of the people, side note. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter, Colonel Scott Ritter? He was one of the uh, inspectors for weapons of mass destruction in the Iraq War. They sent him over there to deal with directly with the so-called enemy and um, keep tabs on what they had or didn't have in the ways of weapons. A very incredible man. And he's been doing journalism on the Ukraine war and more for this past couple of years. And the FBI just went and raided his house and took his passport and arrested him the other day. I wonder if it's the same guys that shot Trump. Probably. Pretty brutal to see what's going on, right? Don't be talking about stuff we don't want the people to know is the theme. We're going to talk about it here. What do we got? The power of thought. Hi, Steve. My name is Rene. The equine vet tech that's been dabbling in animal communication. Oh, wow. I emailed you a few months back. I thought that you would find this interesting. And it may already be known to you. Yesterday, there was a mass global meditation performed by perhaps a billion individuals. The world over at 10.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This was an effort to bring the Earth into a more positive timeline in light of COVID and all the fear that is damaging our collective consciousness, both knowingly and unknowingly. That's interesting. The HZ graph which is public data, showed a huge spike in HZ. What is HZ? Hertz? I don't know. After 10.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Earth normally rests at a radio frequency of... Okay, so it's radio frequency. The Earth normally rests at a radio frequency of 7.8 hertz. Hertz? HZ? And it jumped to 65 HZ in that time period rests at a normal 7.8 and jump to 65. We raised the frequency. Right on. That's exciting, actually, isn't it? Speaking of frequency, here comes Adventure Puppy. Hello, doggy. It's actually not that easy to find any info online about Schumann resonance, as apparently our government bans any websites on the subject. Really? Apparently only Russia has credible public resources for it. Search carefully because the first hit that I got was a website that turned into total spam upon opening it. Interesting. I had remembered your experience with dang hemorrhagic fever and your thoughts on the power of prayer. Thought you would appreciate this. Have a good night. Rene DiGiorgio? DiGiorgio? I apologize for butchered your last name, Renee. P.S. Tell my story. How to hunt.com email was sent back via mail or demon notice, in case you didn't know. Hmm. And here is the uh, screenshot of the of uh, of however they measure it. There you go. 
Interesting. For all you sleuths that want to dig that up and look into it, there you go. The door is kicked wide open. Very interesting and believable for me. We are very, we are very powerful beings. We have just been taught to not think so and to act not like so. That's a fact. Holy cow! I got a freaking book and a half here. What's it about? I'm almost getting a little, uh, I don't know, hesitant sometimes. A few people have emailed in freaking encyclopedias that didn't really go anywhere. Okay, let's try this out and go in. This is titled A Story. Hello, Steve. I've been intending to email for a little while. I know it might not be a while before you read it, too, that, and that's okay. And if you find yourself with some time to read it, this is... This is to read this as it is a bit worthy. Hey, hold on a minute. I'm going to see if Adventure Dog will go chew a bone outside. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. I know it might be a while before you read it, too, and read it to that end is okay. And if you find yourself some time to read this as it is a bit wordy, been watching your hunting slash trapping slash fishing and your Bigfoot Sasquatch videos for a few weeks. Pretty cool outdoor stuff for sure. I also enjoy the scenery in your videos as well as your beautiful horses. Thank you for that. I've been to BC a couple of times, mostly in Vancouver with a side trip to Powell River. Went to Alberta too in the Banff National Park. Such beautiful country for sure. I just caught your newly uploaded video shot from the boat with your friend who related his story about the prince he saw. Beautiful scenery. And thank you for allowing people to relate their stories. Well, I may or may not have much of a story to tell, and it may just be figment of my imagination. However, here it goes. <laughs> okay, you're making me hesitant because this looks like it's going to take an hour to read this. I hope not. I hope this is going to help you or help somebody. I got a lot of people in the line here. <clears throat> Me and my former husband, Doug, went hunting in the Buffalo National River Park in North Central Arkansas. I understand Canada has a Buffalo National Park, too. I'd love to visit. Anyway, I grew up in this area, so the river is very familiar to me. And Doug, though he grew up in Michigan, it was late in the season. I want to say November 96, 97. We were hunting for whitetail and decided to go into this area. Doug had actually hunted there a week before and saw a lot of deer sign. In the area... We, in the area he hunted, he had to canoe across the river coming out on the other side by an old cemetery. Then he climbed the hill from the river and walked a couple of miles into the hay fields and woods above the river. He had told me that when he reached a spot to sit and wait for daylight, he stirred up a big elk from his bed and, crazy as it sounds, almost sat down by him, scared him and the elk for sure. So the next week following his trip, he and I went back there. On our way back down the one-lane road, we saw a big buck that crossed the dirt road in front of our truck. We were excited. I was thinking it was going to be a good day for hunting. We reached the river, unloaded the canoe and gear, and stepped across the river. Once on the other side, we pulled the canoe off the water by the cemetery and headed up to where he had, he had been before. He walked through the woods along the river. Then we proceeded to go uphill into the hay fields. The hill began to be more difficult than I anticipated, and I started having difficulty, difficulty keeping up because I have a heart condition, prior open heart surgery, and it was pounding, and my breathing was labored. I normally would have been able to walk in less, than a, in less of a steep area. However, I told him that if he would find a spot for me to sit down, I'd be okay. He found a place for me to sit that was located in a small patch of woods that was to the right of where we were climbing the steep field. He continued on to find his place, leaving me there. The patch was about two acres in size, and on the far side, further right of the woods, was sort of a road. It was basically a cut through for the farmers to move the machinery from one field to the next, who still baled hay there. The park service still leased the fields to farmers for the hay. This little cut through came up from the lower field and led up into the next field. I sat by a good-sized tree, which gave me a view down 
from my right towards the bottom of the cup through and I could see towards the top which would be to my left and I was able to turn my head back to survey through the woods and an opening in the underbrush back towards the direction we had walked from with a nice view of the fields. So I settled in to wait for daylight. After daylight it came and sometime towards 10 a.m. I just kept sitting because I was not wanting to walk around because of my earlier episode with my pounding heart. I did notice it was super quiet. No squirrels driving me crazy, nor any birds chirping and no wind. Just the quietness all around as the sun rose towards the peak of the day. After a bit, I heard rustling coming up the cut through, heading my way. I readied myself, having my 12-gauge shotgun, anxious to see what was coming up the little cut through the lane. The rustling got closer, and I could see what it was. About 40 feet away were seven does. They were moving in a hurried, hurried manner, with, but not running. We were only allowed to take bucks as we had no doe permits. The seven doe must have sent to me because they made a sudden right turn into the woods. They were across from me. I kept thinking that maybe a buck was behind them, heading my way too. So, for the next 30 minutes or so, I readied myself again and focused on catching a, catching a first glimpse of a buck coming up the cut through like the does had. To my dismay, there was no buck to come by. I figured there was... If there was one, he had scented me and went the other route. So I settled in again, watching and listening up and down the cut, through, and back into the woods, through the opening that I had found earlier. And suddenly, there was something moving in the field below. I saw four very long black legs walking past the opening at a steady pace. The opening as you look down, only gave a view of lower extremities, as the angle did not allow for a full view. I kept thinking that this was the elk that Doug had seen the previous week. I was thinking I was glad I got to see an elk in the wild. However, my mind kept thinking that this elk had the longest legs I'd ever seen. Though I did not see a body nor any antlers through the opening nor the brush, I could see the field where the legs walked past clearly. I only saw legs and they're very black and long. I thought this was odd, but never thought anything more past an elk. As I watched the legs disappear past my view, I started focusing again and was thinking how I was so excited that I'd seen an elk and could not wait to tell Doug I'd seen this elk. I was thinking that, man, I saw my first elk in the wild and all I got to see was his legs. It's quiet again. I returned my focus up and down the cut through the gazing and gazing through the woods. About 30 to 40 minutes later, I was jolted by the loudest crashing in the woods I have ever heard. Now, excuse me, I have seen and heard trees fall in the woods. I've heard bucks come crashing into the woods, but this was so loud that I was shaking like a leaf. And it was so close to me that I did not know if I was going to be attacked by a bear or a wild hog. Funny thing is, those two animals generally are grunting when they're nosing around the woods, but I never heard anything prior to the crashing noise. To say the least, I was very frightened and I tried to shrink up as small as I could and be ready to shoot whatever it was when it came out. I never heard any sound before this happened, as it was very sudden. The sound stopped, and I did not hear footsteps trailing away, nor any continued crashing, as if a larger antlered elk or deer had, for some reason, come banging through the woods. I never heard any more noise, not even birds or squirrels, and still no wind. I have heard trees creak in the woods as wind blows, and I do not hear this as if the wind blew a tree enough to hear creaking. Through the years since, I have re-ran that scene in my mind over and over. I never once thought that this could possibly have been two to four legs of the Bigfoot beings, but maybe it wasn't. But I have for years wondered about those legs that walked by. They were spaced apart more than an elk's front and hind legs, and they were not shaped like an elk's legs. I saw no distinct rump, and no stepping like an animal with hooves do. I remember this pace, more like legs swinging back and forth like a human would walk, and they were not like skinny legs with a hoof at the end. However, I just cannot reconcile those legs with an elk in my mind.
I've seen deer and horses in the woods, ridden horses in the woods, and they tend to make their snorting and whinnying and are, and are real noisy at times. I never correlated to being a Bigfoot until I started watching your videos. However, I only referred to it as being elk legs and nothing more. Maybe I just had a nice little hunting story, I don't know. All right. I did catch the video part one and two of you and Dave Plotis. I'm watching this and other videos and audios about missing people for a while and I found your videos. I have a broken heart because people come up missing and are never found. Such strange stories. I never gave it, gave it much thought being someone who was raised on a natural river that became a natural park. I know people get lost on this river when it floods, thus our high water rescue experience. However, a little girl did come up missing. I think it was 1993, I believe, anyway. Doug assisted in that search, and he did find her. It was his experience in trapping and river experience that was so helpful in knowing how to track and search out where she could be. She was about 10, and she and her dog went missing, and her dog was found to be with her. I believe that I may have the news video somewhere. All right, I just had to skim fast forward in that email, and there's no more in that email pertaining to the topic that we're really trying to get a grip on here. And I do appreciate your outdoor experiences with your husband, the search and rescue, and, um, and what you mentioned in the rest of your email. But um, to tell you the honest truth, I don't have the time to read it here with this, with this huge lineup of a list of people waiting to be heard about what they saw and what changed their lives forever, okay? But I absolutely appreciate you sending in your email. I just have to do that, you guys. I mean, the, the rest of the email was over twice as long as what we just read, and there's nothing in there for us on the topics of seeing these beings in the woods. Nothing, okay? And I appreciate that, but I really have to start cracking down on some of these immensely long emails, okay? Because by the time I'm done them, a lot of the email doesn't really help anyone or the person emailing it, and it makes me miss out on hearing the slew of people who've been waiting who and have taken up they have they have had to take a long time to get the courage just to write in and i need to get those people heard okay so here we go alaska mother and child killed is the title of this email this doesn't sound too uh exciting does it <laughs> The names in the following account are changed to avoid criminal prosecution. Both I and the man who told me of the incident are holders of now inactive top secret clearance issued by DONCAF, Department of the Navy Central Adjudication Facility. I don't know if the details of the incident are still classified. That's why I have changed the names. I apologize in advance for the cryptic nature of the story. However, I've known this man, I'll call him Jim, and served in combat with him for many years. And I have and will stake my life on his integrity. The only reason I'm telling you this is because you struck me as the same type of no BS kind of guy and people have been misled to believe that these are animals. So it's okay to kill them. I think I may have read this. What's the date on this? This is sent in 2020. I'm going for it. Some time ago, Jim was sent on TAD, Temporary Additional Duty, to a unit in Alaska. Most of the time, most of the time there was spent on field, field daying this or that location and sitting around passing scuttlebutt rumors about the nature of their purpose there. The official title was simply Security Force. Training was conducted on target acquisition, field navigation, and winter survival. Alert drills were called almost daily. Jim and his platoon responded to the alert, as always, only this time the truck they had boarded started pulling out. He said they rode for about 15-20 minutes and were ordered to get out. They were in the middle of a huge valley, at which point they were told to follow an officer and a civilian guide. He and the others walked quickly, at first for about a mile, and then were told to be quiet. They were also told to check their weapons. Standard M16s, A4s, and one guy had an M40A3 in 7.62x51 bolt action rifle. They were told they were here to kill an animal that was a threat to the compound and local residences. 
Jim told me that he had been on edge until that point because he didn't know what they were up against, but that a hunt for a bear or something was a relief. They spread out in a skirmish line and moved forward, slowly and quietly, with the guide about 20 yards in front of them. They had advanced that way about 150 yards when the guide stopped. They were just inside a tree line on the edge of a large meadow. As the line got to the guide, Jim said he saw what looked like a dark brown bear about another 50 yards into the meadow. The officer pointed to the bear and indicated that that was their target. At that point, he and the others cycled the bolts and the rifles and took aim. That's when the bear stood up, only it wasn't a bear. He said it was about six feet tall with wide, flat shoulders, not the sloping shoulders of a bear, and the legs were too long to be a bear. Its head was humped, and it had long arms. Excuse me. It turned its head and looked at them. No one fired a shot. The thing grabbed something off the ground and started running away. That's when he saw the second one, smaller, in his words, maybe four feet or five feet tall, following the big one. And they were quick, too. The officer in charge hollered, shoot, and we opened fire. The first to go down was a smaller one. The big one stopped while still under fire and went back to the small one, dropped to a knee and let out what Jim described as the cry of a mother over her dying child. I saw the hair on his arm stand up when he said that. I shit you not. The rest of the story he told me, with his head down, unable to look me in the eyes. We stopped firing when the mother cried out, but the officer ordered us to kill it. So we resumed fire. The mother refused to leave the downed child and took what he said was around 90 to 100 more rounds. She finally went down. No one moved forward, but they stopped firing and reloaded. He said, quote, we held our position for, I don't know, about 10 minutes or so. That's when the officer started to walk toward it. The guide told him to stay there, wait, and give it time to be sure it was dead. About an hour passed with no one talking, and he said, we couldn't even look, e look at each other. My gut was churning the whole time, and I wanted to throw up. Finally, the guide and the officer walked to the bodies and confirmed the kill. The rest of the platoon were not allowed to view the bodies, but were ordered back to the truck. On the way back to the compound, he saw other military vehicles heading toward the site, but they weren't from his compound. He said, I don't know where they came from. I mean, we we're the only military in the area. Upon returning to the compound, he and the rest of the platoon were debriefed one by one and told not to talk to anyone about the mission under threat of a life sentence in Leavenworth. Both Jim and I are retired now, and both their wives have passed, so we don't have much to lose. It took a couple of shots at Jack and some other war stories to get, this, to, get to this one, but I swear every word is true. Jim don't lie, and neither do I, and I'll have words with any man who says this didn't happen. People need to know these are not animals. They are just as human as you or me. I don't know how they came to be, and I don't care. I just want people to know. I hope you can help help make that happen. Feel free to email me if you want more info. Jim won't talk to you. I try to talk him into it, but he refuses. To tell the truth, I think he's ashamed of what he and the others did. He does agree, though, that people need to know. Thank you, Mike. That's a holy shit story, Mike. I believe I did read that a long time ago. The only thing that would make your average person kind of raise an alarm to that red flag to that story, and I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying, in the delivery, as you paint the picture for us, and after literally thousands of people coming here and sharing what they know and what they've seen, it's and especially me being a professional hunter, um, it's... Hard to imagine a full lineup of guys with guns, just on instruction, being able to walk through the forest, whatever, boom, and walk right up to two of them standing right there, intentionally knowing they are going to find them, and then dumping them with the firearms. That part of the story is like a, there's something missing there. And I don't mean, I don't mean there's a lie there. I mean, there's something missing as in, how do they get there? How did they know they weren't going to leave? Why didn't they leave? Why didn't they run? Who knew they were there? You know what I mean? There's a few gaps there 
that would be cool to get answers for. It's probably impossible, but there's just some serious gaps there because I do not believe from the knowledge that I have, I just, it's hard for me to imagine being able to, okay, I'm just going to go down the road. I'm going to get 10 guys armed and we're going to go over there and walk up on these two Sasquatches right now and kill them with confidence. hundred percent. No problem. I got this. I know they're going to be right there when we get there. We're going to dump them. Said nobody ever that I'm familiar with. You know what I mean? So did they escape from somewhere? Was there a known, okay, now you got to come up with some, some outrageous thoughts to come up with an answer to make sense of it. Like, I don't know. Did they know there's some sort of a portal there that closed? Or did, and, and, and they were stranded with nowhere to go. Did they know that they had to go to a certain spot and remain there? Absolutely. So that they could leave this plane. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I'm just trying to come up with how, how could you ensure that two individuals, especially a mother and his kid are going to be right there when you get there with a bunch of noisy guys who are just in the military. They're not stealthy, professional native guide, stalker hunters. You know what I mean? That's a weird one. That's a weird note of the story, but I have a feeling there's a lot more to it than we know leading up to that moment. Right? Pretty alarming. Pretty tough to, to picture going down, like actually picture being there and taking part in that murder. Yep, murder. Okay, this next one's titled, Nana's Bigfoot Story. Hi, Steve. First, I'd like to thank you for giving everyone a platform to tell their stories and experiences. I have no problem with you giving my name. I'm old and I've developed a don't give a shit what anybody thinks attitude. Finally, thank God. Why did you wait till you were old? <laughs> you, well, I mean, what you think is old. <laughs> my story took place during the Christmas holidays of 79 or 80. I came face to face with a beast for the first time while living in the Shenandoah subdivision of Cedar Park, Texas. My sister and I had gotten off work around midnight. We were at retail with ridiculous long hours. We decided to meet up with friends at a local nightclub to unwind. And no, we were not drunk when we headed home around 2 a.m. As we drove into our driveway, the car light beams shone into our neighbor's front yard. That's when we both noticed movement and reflection of eye shine. It was large, hunched over on all fours, and the eyes reflected an amber slash red color. We parked, the motion lights come on. We parked, the motion lights come on, and I walked over to the line of two to three foot tall shrubs that divided the properties. My first thought was that a cow had somehow gotten out of the ranch property directly behind her home. They did have, they did have cattle that at times would come up to the barbed fence, barbed wire fence. I recall the strange smell in the air. It was a combination of wet dog, skunk, and manure. It was deathly silent and cold. I was asking my sister, who we should call, about the loose cow in our neighbor's yard as she walked over to stand by me. I remember in those days there were no cell phones and most people didn't carry any cameras around. Right at that moment, quote, the cow, end quote, stood up on two legs and ran towards us. My sister let out a blood-curdling scream, and the creature stopped around 10 feet in front of us. That was pretty close. I can't recall if he also was screaming, because at one point I couldn't hear anything. As I felt as if time stood still and everything moved in slow motion. These are important points that we really have to start focusing on. All right, you guys? He stood at least eight to nine feet tall, had long blackish slash brown hair that covered his entire body. Very muscular arms, legs and chest, and a very human face. Let me read that again. A very human face. He looked Native American. We stared at each other for several minutes, which in all honesty must have been only a few seconds. He then turned and in a blink of an eye, ran the half acre property and leapt into what looked like a large black hole 
at the back fence, at the back fence line, like an Olympic hurdler. I was frozen on the spot until my sister grabbed my arm and pulled me into the house. I couldn't speak, and my brain seemed so confused for several days afterwards as I attempted to process what we had seen. He came into my dream several times. I would wake suddenly and see him looking through the sliding glass door of our bedroom. We never spoke to anyone except family about what we had seen, but even they ridiculed us. He continued to appear at, at other homes I've lived in throughout Central Texas, and even to this day, I will catch a glimpse of him now and then just beyond the tree line or peeking through the windows. About two months ago, I saw him sitting in a tree in my front yard, but he wasn't alone. A smaller one sat with him. Well, I'm older and maybe just a bit wiser, so I felt compelled to tell my story. My children and grandchildren don't believe me. Well, they think I have an overactive imagination. Thanks for lending an ear, and to those that join in and listen to the experience, all I have to say is, they do exist. Like Steve says, what other proof do you need? And there you go. And I appreciate that email. That sounds pretty freaking alarming. And have you not... That's, that's a while back, too. These are older ones that I'm trying to hopefully dive into the 2,500 emails that I had go missing on my previous phone. Then I'm doing my best I can to find those missing emails and get them heard. All right, you guys? So some of these people wrote in a little while ago. Excuse me. And hopefully you're still here with us. And if you are, could you please email us an update and let us know what else is going on around there. And if any of your neighbors have finally come clean, anybody else in your circle has come clean about what they know or what they've seen. Please. And more members of the club in no return, right? Once you know, you know. There's no going back. Black Government and Sasquatch. Let's title this next email. Hello, Steve. I bumped into your channel about a year ago, and I follow it closely ever since. Wow, you've been on the right track all along with your main subject matter, Sasquatch. You were ever so right when you mentioned the government cover-up is all about money and greed. There are real creatures. These are real creatures. And it is so damn frustrating that more people will not open their eyes to the paranormal and think out of the box. The problem with the majority of people is that they have been conditioned from the day they were born, then through childhood and the adult phase, to believe only what they've been taught to believe with the norms of society and the lying bastards in the government. Amen. I'm now 60 years old and retired having my own Sasquatch experience when I was 12 years old, convinced me that these creatures were not only real, but they have a bit of paranormal anomalies. Do you think? <laughs> yeah, they do. I've done a lot of research over the last 20 years concerning the subject, along with extraterrestrial technology that the government has had for over 50 years. This government agency is known as what I and many others call the black government. The black government has a budget of $800 billion a year and can pull funds whenever they want without being questioned by anyone. They can not only pull funds, but they can also pull funds from any funds that are paid by taxpayers. Is that effed up or what? In the United States government, there are 37 levels of security and the president is only ranked at 23. So there are 14 levels of security above the presidency. The higher levels are mainly military-oriented, but here's the catch. They contract out to private parties for the research and marketing of reverse-engineered extraterrestrial products that eventually become for sale to the public and private enterprise. One of the biggest players in the game is J.P. Morgan, along with two other financial institutions with a net worth of $26 trillion. They make billions, if not trillions of dollars each year from these products such as fiber optics and many, many other products. Yes, it's all about greed and money. Of course, the government knows about the existence of Sasquatch, and if they haven't made any money on it yet, they soon will. Are they ever going to let the public know the existence of Sasquatch? Only time will tell, and it takes people like you, Steve, to get the knowledge of the people. The more people that share their experiences, 
there's going to be more of a chance they'll eventually have to come clean. Always a pleasure watching your channel and keep giving it hell on wheels. I'm a tough nut to crack, but I feel very comfortable sharing this information with you. Thanks, Steve. You're the man. Feel free to give me a call anytime. Dave. Dave, appreciate you, man. I agree with you. I agree with you. The shit show going on. The people in power is frustrating. It's very frustrating to be part of it, right? I was thinking the other day how we could, um, the people that are uncomfortable, the people that have had enough, I mean, what would it take to, to, you have to reshape your community again, block all these big box stores and all these large businesses out. When I saw something on, online the other day during COVID, I think something like 210,000 mom and pop businesses went out of business during COVID, but all the big box stores remained open and they never got compensation and never came back from it. Pretty alarming, right? Quick little random blurb that came out of my brain there. I'll bite my lip because I go on forever, but it sure would be nice if we could. It's almost like there needs to be another another chunk of land out there across the ocean like they did so many years ago when all the people fled Britain, England, to Europe, and Europe to go uh, start a new life and form awesome communities and live naturally and happily. It's like almost like we need to do that again, but where are we going to go now, right? To get away from these treasonous sons of bitches that deserve to swing from branches until they rot and fall to the ground. I bite my lip. Okay, what do we got here? This is titled, I hope this isn't hard to read. It's usually me that ruins emails. I decided I would share with two web portals, both of the places where sh where sharing is safe, and I hope one might one might get to it eventually. I want to thank you for listening. You made this choice easier. I do wish to put in context something that hours of listening to encounter experiences have given me a mediocre of a small bit of a shared knowledge. I decided to put my experience into words as they felt to me at the time, and as best I contextually can. It's now clear to me that what I had interpreted as purring was the creature's raspy breathing. I am Craig Tetwiller, and I live in Clarkston, Washington, and work across the Snake River in Lewiston, Idaho. I included the best steelhead I've ever caught, and one of my 454s next to my 44 mag, which when purchased I thought was enough. Not even close. I just told this story for the first time in my life to my best friend, and only because I was contemplating giving you a go at understanding my story. I drafted this email, but had yet to find the courage to hit send. Partly because who would believe this pile of crap? Mostly because Fear of being shunned and ridiculed is just not worth the cost. I haven't even told family. I worked for the world's leading producer of civilian and law enforcement ammunition. And I have for 23 years now. My preferred shift is weekend days. The reason I chose that shift is simple. Having four days a week off to enjoy the rivers and woods in our area is like being semi-retired. In 2009, I was in a long-distance relationship with a woman who was visiting her family, and whom I met in Lewiston, in a Lewiston eatery. She lived in Missoula, Montana. My time off and lack of children made the five-hour trip over to Low Low Pass a no-brainer. She worked five or six days a week and has two teenage children. It was typically left. It was typically left to me to travel. We had been dating about six months when it became a burden. To both of us, logistically, we began to communicate less, text less, and generally we were just not being very committed to us. After two weeks of no communication, I decided to make a trip over to Montana after work on a Sunday night. It was September, a great time for a night drive. It was going to be a breakup. Goodbye. It's been nice. I called before leaving to let her know my intent. Her response was, fine. The trip... The trip over took me about 4 hours 45 minutes, and it was midnight by the time I pulled into her driveway. We were both 
amendable to what was happening. And sadly, we both really liked each other. She did not want me to be in there in the morning for her kids to see. We kissed goodbye at 0200 in the morning. I immediately headed home after cresting the pass and driving out the river road. I decided to stop and sleep as I had been up 24 hours already. I made it to just past Powell Ranger Station. I pulled into a slow vehicle turnout, turned off my lights, rolled up the windows, and enjoyed the moonlight. After reclining my seat fully, I was still uncomfortable with both the seat and the environment. By that I mean my skin was hyper alive and I was apprehensive, creeped out. It was like I shouldn't be there at all, but I was exhausted. I turned the truck off and locked the doors. I crawled into the back seat of my lifted one-ton crew cab Ford. I awoke shortly later to my chest vibrating, my truck moving like it was being rocked against the locked tranny. I was having a hard time with my senses. I had rolled onto the floor of the back seat and was partially under the seats. Initially, when I crawled into the back, the moonlight was bright in a near cloudless sky. I attributed the darkness due to the position in which I found myself. I got my hands under me, pushed myself awkwardly behind the still reclining driver's seat. I turned and pulled up to a sideways sitting position, feet toward the passenger side. The prevailing darkness in front of the truck did not match the light that invaded the side and the rear windows. And fear had found me. Frozen, unable to move, my chest was vibrating to an audible noise. The best explanation is super amplified, subsonic, slash, or just at the edge of perceptible hearing range. Purring. So, purring? The purring filled my chest. The sound pressure made my breathing almost like trying to catch your breath with a faint, with a fat girl sitting on your chest. I had the feeling the purring was in cadence with the motion of my truck, though I was unsure. The purring and motion of my truck abruptly stopped. I am at this point scared shitless. I don't know why the change scared the shit out of me. I still don't know what time it is. I'm barely aware of anything beyond the deep blackness from the front of the truck. The moonlight returned to the front of my truck. I peeked around the driver's seat to see a massive creature, and I mean massive, seemingly as wide as my truck, easily four or five feet wide of the shoulders, take two steps and cross the highway. It barely hesitated at the guardrail on the river side of the road as its knees were several inches higher than the highway guardrail. I believe it was 10 or 15 minutes before I had gathered myself enough to clamber back into the driver's seat without getting out. My breathing, still stifled and quick, it is at that point I realized I had pissed myself, though I do not know when. I started my truck and drove home my mind trying to get a better grasp of the events and maintain a good hold on reality. I arrived home in a blur a couple of hours later. I showered and tried to rest. I wasn't able to sleep at home, so I decided to get some breakfast slash brunch. I walked by the brush guard in the front of my truck, which is at my eye level. I noticed a handful of knotted scraggly hairs. Literally, I pissed myself involuntarily, uncontrollably afraid. I turned 180 degrees, returned to my house. I spent the rest of the week at home contemplating the things I thought I knew. The purring event, as best I can recall, spanned less than two minutes of my life as it happened. I have and will spend the remainder of this life contemplating how minuscule is my knowledge in this little piece of, in this piece of this little space. You and me both. Me and you. You and me both. It is 2020. I have spent much free time trying to understand the circumstance in which I found myself. I now carry two 454 castles, as they were the largest hand cannons I could buy in 2009. I will not go in the woods without them. On road trips, I load my AR-10 chambered in 338 Federal along with both hand cannons, and I still never stop 
roadside. Should I have to stop? The pair of hand cannons and the three twenty round mags of three thirty eight ease that sinking feeling of dread. I recently made a 2,600 mile round trip helping a friend deliver a trailer in California from Lewiston, Idaho, non stop. Save for a save for except for gas pit stops. 49 hours of wakeful purpose driven driving. I recently have been listening to you, to your YouTube channel, Steve at How to Hunt. I wish to thank you for the effort and the time you sink into this venue. I recommend this avenue to, for those with questions or stories. I also sent this to Wes at Sasquatch, whom I listen to as well. Hope this finds you well, and I apologize for any grammatical errors as I chose to write this on a phone. I also hope this isn't written as garbled as it comes to mind. Thanks for listening, Craig. Okay, man. Um... Okay, I'm not going to share the pictures of your, of your weapons, all right? Because at this stage of the game, with these devices, I believe we need to keep our cards hidden. And that's a beauty fish, man. Nice big chunk of steelhead there. I'll share that. Right on. Beauty. Quite the story. Quite the outcome. Quite the emotional reaction that many people have, right? Now you're in for a lifetime of not sure what's coming up from behind every single stump everywhere you go. That's the shitty deal. That's, that's a lot of the people that come here need some sort of help or guidance in that department, right? And you're only going to get that from listening to everybody here. We're all in other places too. But the only place you're going to get that help and guidance is from other people that know the truth, know what they saw, know they're being lied to, right? Holy shit, are we being lied to? Don't you feel like a simpleton at this stage of the game? If you follow what's what's going on on the planet, I do. It's frustrating. It's frustrating when you know that the quality of life, I mean, apparently the word on the street is, is that if we you are born, it's like winning one of the toughest lotteries in the entire existence of anything. Just to be born and given a life. And knowing that, when you know that you're we're being lied to, manipulated, and and herded in all the wrong directions for some something, something or somebody else's gain, it makes it should make you absolutely on fire. Especially if you have children. Why? Why so many people fall in line? I don't get it. I don't get it, man. Not me. Not me. Not me. Do not comply ever with nothing. Like, fuck, if I could just wish I could just pass that on to so many people. Do not comply. Right? Stand up and frickin' fight. Stand up and fight. Keep sharing this knowledge. Do we got time for another short one? Is this a short one? All right, here we go. Let's get one more out there. So appreciate you sending that in, man. Absolutely appreciate you. And if you're still here and if you learned anything else, send it, send it to me, all right? Give me a follow-up. This is titled My Encounter Question Mark. Hello, Steve. Hope this finds you and Sarah well in your good health and in good health. I truly enjoy your channel as I've been following you ever since the video of the grizzly bear following that moose right into your lap. <laughs> yeah, it was a good day. I love your attitude and lifestyle. I believe even if you were penniless, you would be a wealthy man. Oh, I've been penniless a long time, and I am a wealthy man. Thank you. Well, let's get to it, even though it's probably not as exciting as most of your followers. For now, just call me Grizz, as that's the way, that's what my friends call me. Back in the 1980s and 90s, I used to hunt in the western UP of Michigan. Although it's not as remote as where you go in BC, it's about as remote as you can get in Michigan. Typically, what I do is sit in the morning till about 9 or 10 a.m., then still hunt my compass in a large loop back to my evening sitting spot. I don't recall what year it was, probably 88 or 89. We only had patchy snow, which made it a little challenging to track deer. I came to a dark cedar swamp and figured if I was a buck, that's where I would be. I went about 200 yards or so into the swamp and came across a well-used game trail, so I backed off about 50 yards and found a good place to sit. 
I've been sitting there about a half an hour and noticed it was dead quiet. It was normally very quiet out there, but you could usually hear the ravens cackling and popping, but there was nothing. The more I sat there, the more creeped out I got until my hair turned to wire and everything in my body said, get the hell out of there. So I did just that, following my trail out the way I came. Good move. Good move. It never dawned on me what was going on. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me until I watched your first encounter video. Although I didn't feel the dread that you described, nor did I have a visual, I now know what was causing that feeling. And after that day, every time I was in the woods, my head was and still is on a swivel. I won't let it keep you from doing what I love. In fact, I look at it as a positive, as it has heightened my senses and made me a better hunter. I usually put venison in the freezer every year. I now live in the north northeastern LP of Michigan, and I'm surrounded by woods and still have that in the back of my mind. I'm always packing, as I also caught a large black bear on one of my game cams and also came across some large cat tracks last winter. So sorry about your loss of Mr. Mac. It brought a tear to my eye. I believe horses can look into your soul and be the most loyal friend you could ever have. Keep doing what you're doing, my brother. With much respect, God bless you and your lovely Sarah and all your furry friends. All right, man. Appreciate it. If anything, I'm glad to helping you kick your sixth sense into ruling your moves. We all all, all. If we could have a whatever, 10 step course, I don't know. If somebody, I mean, I am really, really, really been working on my sixth sense for quite some time now because I know it's important. I believe that's one of our senses, our skills that were, that have been intentionally manipulated and, and uh, groomed out of us. Because believe me, I don't recall anybody in that classroom when I was a little boy telling me, okay, look, there's a lot of evil people in the world. They're going to try to control you. Said no teacher ever. And you're going to have to really rely on your gut instincts and your sixth sense, okay? Said no teacher ever. No public teacher ever. Why not? Why not? <laughs> right? If we could all be intimately in control of and in tune with our sixth sense, not one dark son of a bitch would ever be able to pull anything over you or your community, ever. Right down to a shady salesman of vacuums, to a politician, to a, a dirty cop. Right? A dirty religious leader, cult leader, anything, anybody, any, nothing. Nobody would be able to dupe you in life, ever. And we do have our... Whatever, you know, I always say this, whatever you want to call it, your gut instincts, your sixth sense, whatever you want to call it, we got it. And we are not being taught to enhance it when we should be from day one. That should be the number one lesson that is mandatory. Starting in kindergarten, starting from the first time your child can speak English and put words in a sentence. We should be teaching them about their sixth sense, their natural instincts, and to absolutely listen to them above anything at all costs, no matter what. Think about it. What would that do to your community if everybody could tell if something was good or bad? Right? Even in the most minor detail. Even right down to leading, reading the label on a food product on the shelf that's misleading. Your gut instincts would go, yeah, good, but you know, no, we don't put that shit in our bodies. Right? That business would be out of business instantly if you were in tune with your sixth sense, your gut instincts, right? Anything, anything and everything, but we're not. And because of that, look where we are now. Good God, half the stores are, here's a funny, not a funny, here's a sad example, but an easy one. Just on the food department, the nourishment, the natural, you know, what we really truly need to put in our bodies. You know, you go on a road trip and you stop at one of those typical gas stops, you go in that store and you be honest and try to tell yourself what in that store, that gas station convenience store, is actually healthy to put in your body. <laughs> Nothing. Not one item. That's going off topic a little bit, but it's a good example, right? Because we are, we are not led to know what's the truly, truly right and wrong today. We are not. 
Sixth Sense, Gut Instincts, Intuition. It should be a mandatory chorus and every child should have to master that chorus before they can move on. They need that chorus perfected before they can gradu graduate <laughs> to whatever else is supposed to be coming down the pipe. Don't you think? Don't you think? I think last year for me, there's a couple examples of my hunting, hunting experiences really showed me that I am getting a lot better with my instincts, my intuition. A lot better. I don't know how. Is it my diet? What I do? How much time I spend in the woods relying on me? Maybe it's got something to do with it. I don't know. I, uh, maybe I should cut some more energy away from other things I'm doing and concentrate on that so maybe I can master it, make sense of it, and then start to teach as many people as I can. Maybe I should be doing that. I wonder if that would be more worthy of my time to help community. I don't know. I don't know. Now, I came across something. I think it's on my laptop. I was digging in my laptop on my boat at the end of the day, in the evening, and that's where I came across the, uh, I came across two old videos I had on there of the dog, which she was a little puppy. And I put this in yesterday's video for the hell of it. But get this one. I'm going to share it I have to go edit this up, and I'll put it on here at the end, all right? But a uh, handful of years ago, buddy of mine's son, buddy of mine, he uh, sent in two videos he took with a cell phone, and this would have been, I believe, in the Sea to Sky, not Sea to Sky, this would have been, I think, maybe the Pemberton Valley or the Birkenhead, whatever, out there, coastal mountains, all right, where I was living. Then he was hunting. And he recorded these sounds coming from the timber below him on the side of the mountain. And I shared these a long time ago. I'm going to share them again because I opened them yesterday. And if it didn't nearly sound, it, it sounded nearly identical to the sounds that I heard coming out of the timber when I was camped by myself last year. Nearly identical. But the sounds I heard were way louder <laughs> and coming from deep timber, which had never been logged before. I can't say, well, I can't say this sound is absolutely identical, but holy shit, it took me right back there. The second I reheard these sounds, it took me right back to being in my tent last fall by myself, northern BC, and what I heard in the timber that made me go, I'm getting the F out of here. So I'll share that again after I finish battling, because I don't have it right here. The laptop's in the house. I'm out in the shop. Yeah, weird. What the hell is that sound? What is that sound coming from the forest? Anybody else heard this? If, if, if anyone else has heard this, please email me. If you have seen something that made this sound, Please, please, please email me if you've seen what has made this sound. Please get a hold of us through me. But that is so, so similar to what I heard. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Look, I'm getting a little fired up right now. I'm more wide-eyed as I remember it. There you go. All right, I'll stop that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I may, I don't even know what day it is today. I don't even know when I gotta go back to the water. But I may have a very interesting guest coming on here with me before I go back to the water. And if I do, obviously I'll get it up here to share with you guys. I'm gonna try to do that. I just can't say when yet because I'm, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I just woke up. I throw the dog a bone in the shop. She usually chews on it right here and we have her a little hour in the morning as I kind of wake up and then I talk on my day. So I'm not certain if I can pull off this Zoom call before I head back to the ocean. 
If I can, I will, and it's going to be absolutely interesting. Knowledge filled, all right? With someone who was physically picked up by one of these beings, okay? What else? I mentioned the fishing. A buddy of mine, I think, has eight open days at the, before September 1st for salmon halibut. And believe me, it, it's just a pretty tough thing to tell anybody, but if you ever wanted to get your, your, uh, your limit, no matter what, this is the guy. This is the guy. Big boat, very, very skilled angler. Same doc as me, good friend. So that's available. I think I'm booked up. I've talked to the big boss, but I'm pretty sure I'm all booked up. And then uh, also, if anyone wants to go get tuna off of the west coast of Vancouver Island, you're allowed 20 tuna each. It is albacore. It is so good. That meat is so freaking good. We, uh, I went out with my buddy, and we caught 20, yeah, 20 tuna each. I made a video of that. And um, you cut the loins off of it, you know, filled it all out. And then we were looking at him like, that's the exact same tune as you get in sushi. And then Sir had that sauce, a dipping sauce, pulled it out as we were trying to cook dinner for everyone. And we started cutting slices off the loins, dipping it and eating it. Like, oh my God, is that good? Holy shit. And uh, we almost ate all of the tuna that was supposed to be meant for everybody for dinner before we even cooked it. But anyways, that's September. And my friend as well transitions to tuna. And he is the guy to go with. So there you go. Um, and you can email, if you want to inquire, email Sarah at um, book it, book it at howtohunt.com. There, I got that up. What else? I think that's about it. Oh, shit. Bobby. The late, great Bobby Short. I forgot to share her with her today. Well, maybe we'll, we'll hear from Bobby tomorrow. I don't know if she has any of these left or not. I haven't talked to her about it, but I got two. I still got to put this in my truck. I like that one. Still has those, the Blacktail Hunter ones. I got these in my truck. I probably shouldn't have, because then people see them and recognize my truck in the woods. Damn it. <laughs> well, it's what it is. There we go. I think I have something else important to share, but my brain's going blank. I got to go on with my day. Share my story, howtohunt.com. All of the links to get a hold of me or send in your, your knowledge, your first hand knowledge, is in the video description below. All right? I think that's about it. Try to make a difference, you guys. Teach your children honestly. Please, please, please look into and try to figure out how to enhance your children's intuition. I cannot, I cannot express myself probably correctly on how important I have learned myself that that is. It's very, very vital to uh, a happier existence and making change, as far as I'm concerned. Enhancing your children's and yours gut instincts, your intuition, your sex sense, call it what you want, your true self, your true being. That is so freaking important. Very, very important. How did I get there? It has to have been from diet, eating more wild game, fishing game than not, laying down and drinking out of a creek more than not to get my water for a lot of times of the year and uh, running around the woods relying on my senses. It's got to be how I enhanced mine, I'm thinking. It must be. And your, and your brain, obviously, your mind. Anyway, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow, no matter what, unless something really weird happens. <laughs> Later!